<clears throat> okay, folks, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, I'm going to get going. We we have a couple of different things to get through today, and I uh, wanted to go through at least the beginning part of where we're going to go to next. I know some of you have your PSL 350 exam, so we'll try to uh, make sure that you get out of here on time as well. Um, so we're going to try something a little different this year, and we're going to um, still talk about depression, and I'll give you an overview of depression, but we're going to look at it from a slightly different perspective um, because there is new research coming out based on depression. So one thing is, for sure, we now understand that depression is due to inflammation, and um, inflammation and the brain is something that all of you will be hearing about throughout the rest of your time here at the University of Toronto, um, in the sense that um, whether you're talking about a neurodegenerative condition, or you're talking about an acute condition, or you're talking about brain trauma or traumatic brain injury, all of them, that whole sequela of events, every last one of those things that are injurious to your brain, all involve inflammation. And we now understand that inflammation is the key driver for both acute and chronic processes that are bad for you. So we're going to um, go through that. I'll, I'll give you some new data about um, inflammation and the brain and the different cells that seem to be responsible for this. And again, it's, it's somewhat new, so it's somewhat controversial, but that's what neuroscience is really about. It's not about the hard, fast answers that we think we know because it might be wrong tomorrow. So I'm going to take you through um, this first sort of lecture based on uh, depression. And many of you will have uh, taken part in all of the different things related to the Bell um, you know, Mental Health Awareness Week last week. So hopefully you have a good understanding of what depression is. It's likely, again, depending on the statistics and depending on your background and depending on a variety of different factors, it's been estimated that somewhere between 10 and 20% of you, so all of you sitting there right now, uh, will develop depression at, at some time in your life. And that, um, again, is a pretty staggering statistic if you think about it. So we, I will go through this really quickly and um, we'll talk a little bit about this. So we'll start off with the same thing I ask every year. So if you were to come back to U of T for life sciences, would you do so? I'm, I'm assuming that some of you would say, yes, you know, U of T has got the best reputation for um, life sciences and it gives me like the access to the best research and all of that. Um, or you might say, you know, U of T is a very stressful environment not really happy with U of T. But I, I put this up here not, not for fun, but to um, give you some idea that we don't really understand what stresses out some students versus other students. We don't know what the stressors are that will make you, for example, become depressed. And this will be one of the um, key themes that we go on throughout uh, the rest of the semester. Some, some of you will have found that U of T is incredibly stressful over the last three to four years. And some of you will have really enjoyed U of T over the last three or four years. And that sort of background, that sort of uh, difference in opinion is really what um, we're interested in because how you get stressed out by different environments, whether it's stressed out in HMB 300 or in your other courses is really um, key. And it's really something that uh, we're interested in. So I want you to care about this for a variety of reasons. One, uh, many individuals in your family are going to be affected. So for example, I knew a lot about depression. I had heard about it from Dr. Yeomans in HMB. Uh, I forget what the course code actually was in HMB. It was psychology way back in the day. I'd heard his lecture on depression. I sort of internalized it. I really enjoyed his um, talk on depression as an undergrad here when he was my prof. And I thought I knew a lot about depression and I, I, got, I developed depression one day and um, I didn't even know I had depression. And it was that type of thing that really irritates me. Here I am, someone who's gone through and done undergraduate here at, at U of T in neuroscience. I've gotten my master's degree in neuroscience. Uh, I had my PhD in neuroscience. And I was even a postdoc in uh, neuroscience. And so you'd expect that I would have a better understanding of what depression is and if I was going through depression and yet I didn't. And it was um, is one of those things that I want you to care about because you will likely see someone with depression. And it's not something that um, should be taken lightly. Depression is a very serious mental health disorder. It affects many individuals and I want you to be very passionate about it. I want you to be passionate about it also because you are at the best university in terms of neuroscience in Canada. 
and the the sad part about all of this is we don't understand depression right so um, I want you to be passionate enough about it so that you'll make a difference that you'll think about it how can we actually find out we don't have a reliable measure um, for depression how do I know you're depressed well I can't stick you in an MRI machine I can't tell that your brain is inflamed or not I can't draw blood work we don't have a reliable yardstick to tell if you have depression if you have a fever all I need to do is uh, put a thermometer um, in your ear or wherever else and I'll know that you have a fever but I won't be able to tell if you have depression and I think that as neuroscience students you should be the individuals that are at the forefront of um, really understanding and making inroads into depression so we're going to start looking at depression and again this year we're going to concentrate very heavily on inflammation and the brain um, unlike in previous years and um, I'll I'll uh, get take you through some of the latest research to suggest that different toll like receptors and toll like receptors along with um, inflammatory proteins are one of the potential targets for depression um, and again along the way we'll talk about uh, a number of different uh, model systems and why we don't have a good model system again it's it's um, almost inconceivable to me that we don't have a reliable model system and that's been one of the key drivers from last lecture where we talked about Parkinson's we don't have a great model for Parkinson's nor do we have a great model for things like um, depression we've known about um, and again don't worry about these slides I'll tell you exactly what you need to know from today you don't have to worry about any of this we're not uh, it's really to give you an overview so we know that um, from the days of Hippocrates the earliest recorded times where a uh, physician like Hippocrates was actually recording what was going on we know that um, depression has been around as long as we have um, recorded history as long as someone's been writing something there's been depression and the first person to actually try to ascribe a theory behind depression was actually uh, Sigmund Freud and Sigmund Freud actually tried to separate out um, the difference between sadness and mourning for for someone's loss versus what he called melancholia and melancholia is what we would now say you're melancholy but he sort of was looking at this as depression and and his first theory and again you have to think of him as a 19th century psychiatrist um, no sophisticated tools no sophisticated measures but when he was looking at this he he noticed a couple of things one you don't spontaneously fall bless you wow that was loud um, it's okay don't worry about it the first thing is you don't fall into depression spontaneously it's not like you're walking down the street and um, you suddenly get depression he knew that there was usually a trigger that was involved in depression and for the most part as you would suspect this type of depression involved the loss of someone who is really important in someone's life someone dies in your family are you likely to get depressed probably right and so this concept of depression that he started to develop as a psychiatrist was really that you had unresolved anger issues toward the person who died because that person was no longer there and you couldn't resolve that anger that anger was something that was turned inward and that inward turning of that anger this inappropriate um, channeling of that anger was actually what um, was driving uh, depression and we now know that there are some things that are right about that theory one that you need a trigger no matter what if, if you have a genetic predisposition or not again controversial or um, whether whether or not a uh, stress is involved we need a trigger for all of this to occur and sometimes that trigger and that stress can be good um, and sometimes it can be really um, bad forms of stress um, which is why you know I was asking at the very beginning how stressful is U of T as an environment for you so if if we think about this your brains right now are actually almost finished fully developing there are no more pathways to develop you are undergoing synaptic pruning and somewhere between the ages of 25 and 30 your synapses are actually going to start to retract and from the time that you start going from 30 to 40 where you have the stabilization of your synapses in your final form starting from the age 40 onwards you're going to start losing neurons and we're we're actually trying to push through stress the loss of your neurons and the loss of your synapses um, before the loss of your uh, neurons and so it's um, 
really troubling to me that we're taking like our best students and really stressing you out and pushing you toward like early premature aging of your brain, which is really what inflammation looks like. The bad, the bad part about depression is because you tend to be ruminating a lot, you tend to be thinking a lot and you don't want to interact with other individuals because you want to be thinking about things on your own. Um, this often leads to suicidal thoughts. And of course, a lot of behaviors are uh, re resulting from these um, types of thoughts. And whether or not depression really is aggression um, turned inward, not so sure. Um, again, why, why should you care about depression? You guys are all young individuals and you might think, Depression is never going to hit me, not going to affect my family because um, we're a happy family. We get along with each other. We're financially secure. Um, you know, uh, I'm healthy. Everyone else in my family is healthy. But again, just take a look at uh, some of the statistics. Major depression, also known as unipolar depression, is actually one of the biggest diseases in terms of the burden of disease. The loss of productivity is striking when you have depression. And uh, again, I can share my own anecdote with you as well as what I've heard from other individuals. So how many of you have had the flu before or had a cold? How, how long have you had the cold for? About a week? How do you feel when you have the cold or when you have a flu? Miserable? You don't really feel like yourself. You don't really feel like coming to class. You don't really feel like you're energetic. You feel unmotivated. These are all things that are exactly what you feel like when you have depression. You can still come to class. You can still be sitting there, but you might not feel like you really want to be there. And imagine having that flu um, where you feel like, I, I should be able to get better, but I can't. Um, imagine having that flu for a year or two years. And this is what this loss of productivity is. So imagine like, you know, I just can't study. Like I just don't want to be hitting the books. And this is one of the things that is really bad about unipolar or major depression. Again, the age ranges that get affected are really also striking. The typical age ranges are between the ages of 15 and 44. You are all in this age range. And this age range is a really important one, um, both economically as well as um, from a physiological standpoint as well. This is where you're supposed to be the healthiest that you're, you're going to be in your life, right? When you hit um, older ages, you're going to be more and more sick more often. Um, but this is a mental health disorder that's striking you down in your prime. So when we talk about major depression, and we'll talk about other um, types of mental health disorders along the way, including bipolar disorder, including um, some other mood disorders as well, we talk about these as a class as a, an effective mood disorder. And these mental disorders usually uh, result from a change in mood. So you've been a, a pretty um, stable individual and now suddenly you seem to be down all the time and that would be a change in mood. Or in some cases, if you have bipolar disorder, you might go through periods of time where you're really, really happy, you seem to be really positive that everything is going well for you. And then you might go through um, stretches of time where you feel like nothing is going well for you and you feel like um, everything that can possibly go wrong is going wrong and you'll go through this um, other extreme. And these manic disorders where you have extremes or you have a unipolar where you're always down, it's always in one direction um, in terms of major depression, um, these, are, these are often very serious uh, disorders, not only because you have a loss of productivity, but also in the majority of cases, about 20% of cases that have major depression will result in suicidal thoughts. And of the 20%, about 80 of 80% 80 of those will actually uh, end up in some sense um, where the, uh, the suicidal thought is taken toward action. So it, it's a striking disorder that way. In, in many instances, this is also accompanied by psychoses, um, like hallucinations. You might have an altered sense of reality, and some of you will be able to um, put together that uh, bipolar disorder. This is a little bit more common. So is it possible to have a mild form of depression? Um, yes, it is, right? So it's not this uh, form of depression where you are... Um, Again, and we'll get to that in a moment. It's not this uh, extreme form of depression where you really can't um, function well, but you might have this 
form of depression known as dysthymia. And this is a long lasting, at least two years. So again, imagine having like a, a flu for about two years plus, doesn't have to be just two years, you could go on much longer. Um, and you are in this low, dark or sad mood on most days for about two years uh, time. Imagine hanging out with someone like that. Would you want to hang out with someone like that? And most oftentimes, no one wants to hang out with you if you are constantly in this depressed state. So they can be depressed for years. They can still function. And again, some of you have this um, stigmatization of individuals with mental health disorders that if you're depressed, you're going to be lying in bed all day with the shades drawn, and you're going to be feel, you're going to be crying all day. That's not the case at all. You might be sitting beside someone right now in this lecture room that's going through depression, and you'll never know that because they're still able to function. But they won't be able to function well. They won't be able to concentrate nor do anything else really well. And again, if you're in this constant state of depression for years at a time, your relationships are obviously going to suffer. And guess what? That makes this whole cycle go worse, right? So yes, everything is going bad. And so this makes um, getting out of that depression cycle incredibly difficult. It's incredibly hard to diagnose. So in young individuals, because remember, it strikes from 15 to 44, and again, many of these affective disorders do, this mood um, can be irritable. Instead of being in a depressed down state where you're sad, where you're, you're having these dark thoughts, you might just be irritable. You might look like you're angry all the time, right? And how do you know the difference? If you're a teenager, and I have a teenage daughter, most of the time, she looks like she's angry at me. Like, Dad, why are you asking me how I'm doing in school? Leave me alone, right? She's doing okay, by the way, so not, not to worry. So, sorry? Good thing, you asked. Good thing I asked, that's right. Um, so, you know, how do you know? And again, it's the job of psychiatrists to be able to do this. And again, for bipolar disorder, yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, I just have a question. I don't know if that's a concern or Yeah? Every time, like, depression comes up in class or whatever, yeah. Yeah. disorders that are hard to diagnose yes. or, or like they can be mis I guess they can be misconstrued as something else rather than yes ab now. absolutely yes how much of the disorder is like is it like changes in the brain that that result in these in, in these outwards of, outward like signs of depression or is it depression that like it's a mind state prior to you having these changes in the brain and then like I just feel like it gets over um, medicalized in, without like offending anyone um, in terms of over-medicalized, in what sense? So, so um, again, the best research suggests a couple of things, and we'll talk about this, not, not today, but we'll talk about it on Thursday. Um, this, this is the big issue that I have with um, uh, what you're just suggesting. H how many of you have a wallet or a purse or whatever? How many of you carry around an MRI of yourself in your wallet? No one. Oh, okay. You should. Um, the problem is, what, what does your brain look like today when you're nice and healthy? I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming so too. But, but you have no baseline to compare that to, right? Um, you know what your weight is today. You know what your height is today. You know a lot of different things about yourself. But you have no idea what your brain health is like right now, right? And so how do you know if, for example, your brain is undergoing atrophy? And that's one of the issues. Is it possible to misdiagnose um, depression? I'm going to take you through the cases where, yes, absolutely, because it's a, it's a human call, right? There's no way to stick you in an MRI machine and tell you that, yes, your brain is shrinking. Your amygdala is bigger. Your prefrontal cortex, the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is, is much um, smaller than it should be. Um, how do I know that if you have like variation in your brain size compared to everyone else to begin with? The only way to tell is to compare it to your healthy brain, which none of you have any access to, right? So we'll get into that in a moment. Um, and it's a, it's a good thought. And this is why we need animal models to actually see if, you know, they, can we actually go in and find a biological reason for depression? So indiv individuals that have this type of illness, in this case, bipolar disorder, they tend to um, have these extremes, uh, which is why it's bipolar. The old name for this is manic uh, depression. 
Um, and again, in terms of mania, um, you might have um, changes in your sleep pattern where you need less sleep. You might have overconfidence, racing of thoughts, uh, behavior changes, of course, um, surprisingly increased energy. Um, and again, you have this uh, stylized view of what bipolar disorder is or what someone with manic depression is that um, one day they're really, really happy and really, really um, Charlie Sheen-like, and the next day they're really, really down. But in fact, that's not the case. Usually it's a slow, gradual process, and Hollywood tends to want to dramatize this whole process, and it, it's actually um, really inconvenient for us as neurobiologists to um, have this mindset that it's a sudden onset. It can be, don't get me wrong, but that's rare. It's not the uh, most common cause. So in terms of major depression, and I'll take you through a couple of slides on major depression, um, there's a lot of debate about this. So is there a pre-existing mindset? Are you like more susceptible to developing depression because of your mindset, because of your biology, for whatever reasons? The one thing that is clear is that for you to have major depression and to be diagnosed by a psychiatrist to have major depression, you need to have a trigger. And it's, it's usually a stressful event in your life. And the stressful event, um, whether it's a crisis that's really overwhelming, um, loss of someone in your life, um, the loss of your finances, um, the um, loss of, uh, the loss of uh, your lifestyle, whatever it is, um, it can be something that is stressful for you. In addition to that, it doesn't have to be bad. You get a brand new job, you're promoted and you become the president of um, uh, a company and you can also develop depression because that stress, even though it's a good stress, uh, might be overwhelming for you. Again, it's an interference in your normal functioning and this can continue for months to years at a time, it can be somewhere between seven to uh, 14 months usually. Um, it's possible for a person to have only one episode of major depression in their entire life. That, that happens. But it's very, very rare. And uh, it's more common if you've had one episode of depression that you will have another episode of depression. And if you have the second episode of depression, that you will have a third episode of depression. Um, for example, it's, if you've had one, you are at 70% more risk of developing a second um, bout of depression. So um, just to share a little bit with you, because I think it's important. Uh, when I first started teaching here at the University of Toronto and specifically in the human biology program, I really wanted to um, do a lot of cool things with my students. And doing cool things with my students was really important to me as part of my teaching philosophy. And so when I started teaching in the spring, um, one of the things that I wanted to do, because I had heard a lot about depression and it was on um, the list of things that uh, our program wanted us to cover, um, I wanted to see if I could induce depression in myself. I had no idea why I wanted to do that. Um, it was kind of a, a weird thing in retrospect. But I wanted to see, and I think it was almost because I, I felt I couldn't do this. I wanted to see if I could induce depression in myself. And so for a period of about five weeks, about four, four to five weeks, um, I deprived myself of sleep, allowing myself to get about four hours of sleep a night. I wanted to be just like all of you, right? So I see you guys all active on Facebook at two o'clock in the morning, showing up to class um, bright and early on on uh, at nine o'clock, I, I know that you guys are lacking in sleep. So I wanted to see if stress would indeed induce depression in me. And I also decided that um, a change in my lifestyle in terms of eating would also be um, a good thing to stress my body out. Um, for whatever reasons, I thought all of this was a great, brilliant experiment to do on myself. And uh, so for about four to five weeks, I, I lost sleep. I decided to eat whatever I wanted to eat, but it had to be junk food. So I'd often be out at the uh, food trucks and buying those um, French fries loaded with gravy and all that other stuff that all of you eat all the time. And I did that for about four to five weeks. Um, after the four to five weeks, I came back to class and I started, by the way, at around this time of year in January, I came back, uh, January, February, and I came back to class uh, right before reading week because I remember this very clearly. And, and by the way, in case you're wondering, is this a false memory? It is not because I still have, I still have the um, audio recordings from that class and I keep it around. Um, I came back to class and I almost challenged my class and I said, see, I, I, um, I stress my body out. I stress myself out. I'm a lot older than you and I don't have depression. The problem is that 
um, after the summer. So that was uh, February uh, into March. I had no issues whatsoever. But starting in the summer and then into August, um, I started to notice a couple of things that were different. So one, like I, I really didn't want to start teaching anymore. Like I remember very clearly in August before the semester had to start that I actually went to talk to my program director at the time and I said, is it is it okay if I stop teaching for about a year or so? And she was like, but you're on contract and you have to be in class and you should be giving me your syllabi right now. Um, and, I, and I remember that really clearly and I was thinking, what, where did that idea come from? Where did that thought come from? And once I started teaching, and that's something that I liked doing, once I started teaching, um, one of the things that I was doing in every single class and students would be asking, um, about this, I'd be standing over here at the door. And the reason I was standing here at the door was I wanted to leave. Every class that was in class, I actually wanted to leave. And I'd be looking at the door or I'd be like standing really close to the door. And I wanted to leave because I was totally unmotivated to be in class. I still showed up every single class, didn't miss a single one, was not late to a single one. But throughout the entire class, the only thought I was thinking of every single class was, I should be leaving. I should like leave and no one will even care that I left. And that was the only thought while I was delivering a lecture that I had. And this lasted for nine months. And I knew at the time in September that there was something really wrong in, in, the, in the office where I was sharing my office at the time with someone else. Um, they also started to notice that I didn't want to talk to them at all. I like, completely ignored them. I wanted to be by myself and I wanted to do, um, things where I just didn't want to see students. I'd like um, completely lock myself out. So I, I want to visit a psychiatrist because it's important. And uh, again, for Asian individuals, some of you uh, might notice that I'm Asian. And one of the things that's really bad is that there is a stigma that, um, you know, in, in Asian culture, that um, mental health is, if, if you go visit a psychiatrist, it's not good for you, right? No, you sh no one should know that you visited a psychiatrist. And that was sort of the stigma that I was dealing with. But I knew, like, there's something wrong. Like, I could feel that there was something wrong with the way I was behaving. And this, this diagnosis is very difficult. You can't diagnose yourself. You should never diagnose yourself. Sitting here in this lecture, hearing these different things, you should never be thinking, I have depression. You have to go see a psychiatrist. I did, and it was, um, it was one of the hardest things that I had to do, to be quite honest. I was embarrassed to go there, but I knew also that um, there might be something uh, much more um, uh, underlying uh, what I was going through. So the important thing is for these types of depression where I had a trigger, a stress, and in my case, it was a self um, stress that I brought on myself. Um, it wasn't a loss of my family members or anything else. Um, but this stress was actually um, something that uh, um, caused the depression. And one of the important things is many medications. If you have hypertension, if, for example, someone in your family has high blood pressure, they are given different drugs that affect the noradrenergic system, they may develop depression-like symptoms. If you're taking off those medications, those symptoms disappear. And it seems to be, again, um, really common that uh, either through underlying medical conditions or through medication or through um, illegal substance use, that can't be the reason for why you have depression. And again, if you are actually starting in the down state. One of the things that um, my psychiatrist was really worried about was what if this is actually sort of a bipolar disorder? What if it's the beginning of the extremes that you might see later on? And so is this a uh, manic mixed or um, hypomanic episode? Also very um, important to get diagnosed for that um, clearly as well. So the epidemiology, uh, I've already mentioned to you, the major cause of disability in the age ranges of 15 to 44 um, is where this will strike. The median age of onset is 30. I was in my late 30s when um, this, this all happened, by the way. Um, and as a uh, source, these are the types of things that also stand out. It's more likely, for example, that females will develop depression than males. Um, in Parkinson's disease, for example, it's the opposite. Males are more likely to develop Parkinson's than females. But in this case, the major depression seems to be the opposite. Um, yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, so I just like the one on the, how the medication doesn't lead to depression. Yes. Um, So some of the high blood pressure drugs, and we'll talk about one or two of them on 
Thursday, um, can actually affect the noradrenergic system. And by doing so, they can actually deplete the noradrenergic system. Your heart is working too hard. And one of the things that your heart causes your heart to beat faster is noradrenaline, right? So you want to deplete noradrenaline. And you're given a drug like reserpine or others that actually um, deplete your noradrenergic pools, but it does so in your brain as well. It's not just the um, fibers that are the, that are leading to your heart, um, your brain gets affected. And as a result, you might fall into depression. The earliest models for depression involved noradrenaline and serotonin. And um, that sort of stuck around as a result of um, earlier studies. So right now, um, there is no identifiable cause. Um, it's again, something that I want you to think about as young neuroscience students. Like, what is the cause for this really bad disorder? Um, it's likely going to be multifactorial. It could be genes and environment. It could be um, a number of different factors. You might have a genetic predisposition of not being able to handle stress well. You might be more vulnerable to stress. Um, again, it's not really clear. There is often some genetic component that's been suggested. For some individuals, there seems to be a linkage in your family. So if you have an immediate family member, a brother, sister, first cousin, for example, who has previously exhibited any kind of uh, mental health disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, you, you might be um, 40 to 50% higher in terms of your risk for developing depression. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if, for example, compared to someone else who is of the same age, if you have someone in your family that has um, had depression and both of you have exactly the same stressor, you are probably more likely to develop depression down the road. Again, one episode of depression um, has a strong link for a secondary bout of depression, a 70% increase, and a tertiary um, increase, almost 100% guaranteed. If you've had two bouts of depression, it's almost 100% that you will have the third. Um, is there a change in the neurochemistry? Again, very, very controversial. Many of you will have heard about um, the neurochemical basis for depression, now thought to be erroneous, and we'll talk a little bit about this. Does the brain physically change? Yes, it does. Your brain physically changes um, in many, many different ways that we'll get to later on in the course, sort of as a jumping um, board for a variety of things. So again, you don't have to worry about memorizing this list of things. You don't have to worry about the next few slides. It's to give you an idea of the types of questions that are asked of you. When we go back to this diagnostic statistical manual version four, I don't like version five because it's changed around a lot of different things. I still like um, version four the best. The diagnostic criteria for depression from DSM-4 are things like depression, irritable mood, again, makes sense, that's the name of the disorder. Um, this, this decreased interest in pleasurable activities, didn't like teaching anymore, the decrease in a pleasurable activity. Um, significant weight gain or weight loss. Why those two extremes? Shouldn't it only be like weight gain or shouldn't it only be weight loss? Again, hard to, hard to, um, kind of rationalize those two, but take a look at the rest of the list as well. Insomnia, sleeping too much, uh, sorry, not sleeping enough, or hypersomnia, sleeping too much. So again, another extreme, very hard to diagnose this. And you're sitting there talking to someone who's trying to go through this checklist related to this. In any case, you have a change in your sleep state, very important in mental health, very important in neurodegenerative conditions. Um, changes in your sleep state seem to be um, one of the first signs and indicators that you'll hear about from Dr. Kalia, actually. Parkinson's patients, for example, will wake up in the middle of the night and start hitting on the person sleeping beside them because of changes in your sleep habits. You are moving around too much, psychomotor agitation, or you're not moving around enough, retardation. So again, another extreme. So it's not like you know, my, my temperature is like now at um, 38 degrees. I have a fever. I know that for a fact. It's really hard to um, balance out all of these different types of things. Again, not all cases, but in some cases, you have recurrent thoughts of um, suicide or death. Um, and again, these seem to be the ones that get popularized a lot in the media. You take all of those criteria and then you create a questionnaire that you um, get ranked on. So do you... and 
this is what your psychiatrist asked. This is what my psychiatrist asked me. They, we sat down and we had a little chat. Um, you know, ha, are there changes in the way that you experience um, things that you used to enjoy? Um, is it like you don't have any enjoyment or pleasurable activities at all? Is it once it, uh, like do you only have a pleasurable sense um, once a week um, or two or three times a week, etc.? And you get ranked and you get scored. Um, on this and they simply total all of this up. This is how your psychiatrist will analyze you um, And if you have a very very low score on that PHQ 9 questionnaire, then you likely don't have depression um, You might have mild symptoms again, not maybe not something to really worry about um, But if you have like moderate symptoms as I did here um, so this was my score 16. I had moderate symptoms when I went to visit my psychiatrist So is it is it something to get uh, worried about? Yes, because we had to sit down and talk about different potential treatments um, Moderately severe symptoms or really severe symptoms you've hit like three on every one of those scales then you have um, a risk for developing thoughts of suicide so again these are all really important um, you, we don't have to worry about this list now we'll get back to some of these antidepressants for example medication how many of you take Tylenol for um, a headache or Advil or whatever or aspirin does it does it work yes for the most part it does the vast majority of you will know that if you take Tylenol for a headache the headache usually disappears about 90% of you will have positive effects with Tylenol if you have depression these um, antidepressant drugs and we have a whole list of them by the way it's not like we have one or two drugs we have uh, in in excess of different classes of drugs we have over 90 different drugs that can be used in different combinations but it, it's only 30% efficacy so you go in you get a drug it's like a crapshoot only one in three will actually be helped by this uh, first-line drug and we'll talk about some of these um, the uh, older class of uh, tricyclic antidepressants still in use today by the way and uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors all the way through to the mo modern um, drugs that are used um, psychotherapies talk therapy cognitive behavioral therapy that um, Aaron Beck uh, is a big proponent of um, just talking about your issues is often um, good enough or you could combine medication with psychotherapy or others and ultimately at the end I decided after sitting down with my psychiatrist and uh, deciding that since I had uh, moderate uh, symptoms that I wanted to do none of these and so we decided to try a different approach um, on that and I'll get into that sort of in the next uh, lecture as well so all of these different things changes in mood disruption and basic drives you are changing things related to sleeping and eating that is a basic drive it's a fundamental drive cognitive disturbances where things in your frontal prefrontal cortex might be affected um, rumination where you're consistently thinking about things over and over guilt indecisiveness um, potentially uh, persistent thoughts you keep thinking about suicide it's not you know suicide once or twice it's like you're continually thinking about suicide all of these things suggest that different structures like the frontal cortex things like the limbic uh, brain uh, potentially the reward centers and others might be involved and so this is really where neuroscience has to come in and take over because I think that it's important for us to realize your brain gets affected it's not simply a uh, psychiatric condition it's a biological condition as well and again all of these things relate back to different brain structures so um, if you have a lack of motivation is it your noradrenergic system that's being affected um, and again we'll get back to all of these things a little bit later on in the course I can share one thing with you which is why I usually ask um, that students get a lot of sleep um, that that was many years ago so it's been over six years since I no longer had depression um, in that intervening time though my brain has changed so I can't concentrate the way that I used to I can't remember student names the way that I used to and every time when it is some somewhere between June uh, sorry January and uh, March I can't sleep just like I started um, six years ago I have insomnia that still lasts to this day and it still bothers me like um, I'm, I'm almost at the stage where I want to get um, tranquilizers that or sedatives that will allow me to sleep because at this time of the year where I want to be able to sleep I simply can't 
And whether or not my brain retains a memory of what happened six years ago that's lasted until this time, I'm not really sure. But I can tell you before that, I used to have no problem like sleeping from like 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but nowadays, I can't go to sleep until about 2 o'clock and I have to wake up by 6. And uh, it's, a, it's a really, um, for me, it's a little bit troubling to be quite honest because I'm not really sure what all of that means. So we'll go back and we'll talk about different types of factors other than stress and we'll talk about stress as a as a continuum into inflammation in the brain and we'll talk about how different types of um, disorders so pancreatic adenocarcinoma one of those medical conditions that I mentioned earlier some breast tumors have also been implicated in causing individuals to get depressed not the diagnosis of breast cancer but the biological cause of breast cancer has been implicated as well as different drugs we know that drugs can affect your brain tremendously and things like isotretinoin and interferon um, alpha are going to be important again i'll mention this now because i'm going to make the case to you on thursday we do we do not have a gene therefore we have no transgenic animal that's available to us therefore we have no model organism therefore we don't really understand the biology again all, all shameful to me, it's shameful that we don't. So one area that is really interesting, outside of the interest in inflammation, which we'll get to, one other area that's really important is this area here, which is these uh, long non-coding RNAs. Right now, in both neurodegeneration as well as in mental health disorders, we think that one of the key players that might be modulating this, which is why we haven't been able to find a good gene candidate, um, are the production of these short microRNAs. And these microRNAs that I'll go through this pathway with you on Thursday have been implicated in diseases like major depression, um, Alzheimer's disease. Most of the neurodegenerative mental health disorders have been implicated um, with the different miRNAs. Good, good luck on your PSL 350. So we'll talk more about this in this specific pathway. I'll take you through this pathway in some more detail um, on uh, Thursday's lecture and why this pathway is so incredibly important um, for you as young biologists because now this is really the future of what your your era uh, will be looking at it's really the micro RNAs it's really the inflammation in the brain um, that's going to be driving the biology behind all of these different things so um, I'm just going to spend the last two to three uh, two to five minutes talking about your final assignment uh, your initial assignment that's due next Tuesday so I gave you all an extension on this um, Many of you have um, started reading your paper, and when through reading your paper, you've realized this is not the paper for me. Don't like it. Don't understand it. Not as cool as I originally thought it was going to be. I also switched my paper. So um, this is the paper that I'm actually going to be reviewing. Uh, not that I didn't mind the other paper that Catherine had um, actually suggested to me. It was pretty good, and to be honest, I was reading through it, and it, it was okay. Um, but this paper came out yesterday and I couldn't put it down. I don't know if you get like so excited that you like literally can't put a paper down and you have to read it from start to finish. Every, everyone's kind of looking down now. Don't look down, like it's okay, it's okay. Like I, I, I honestly was never so excited to read this paper in my entire life. Like I couldn't put it down and I just finished reading it in about um, 30 minutes. Then I went back and I reread it again. And uh, then, then I um, started going upstairs, waking up my wife and my kid. And I said, look at this paper. And there, um, you know, I just couldn't believe how incredible this paper was. And this is the paper that um, I'm going to take you through. So this is a, a brand new paper. And I picked it for a reason. So some of it is because the biology is uh, one that you should know. And this is one of the figures that actually isn't in the paper, but because this paper is going to be an instant classic in neuroscience, this paper will actually be probably uh, work its way into the textbooks for the next uh, 10 years time. This is one of the figures that came out um, online to accompany the paper, but it was actually not a figure from the paper itself. I'm not gonna take you through all of the science, but I wanted you to start thinking about these next few images as I give them to you in terms of what you might do um, for your visual data. So this was one of the figures 
that this paper was using. And they um, outlined in figure one the way in which they designed the experiment and some of their preliminary data from the experiment as figure one. So the first one that I showed you was actually not part of the experiment. This is actually experimental results. Um, the next figure here shows, if I can get it to go, some more results from their paper. Um, again, would you, would you put this one up as part of your visualization um, result? Um, so you might be thinking about that right now. So this is another figure here, and then these other two are the last figures that they had in terms of uh, results. How many, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, I, so so the, the acid test, what you should be doing is based just on this and maybe a little bit of writing at the bottom, would, would someone be able to understand the paper? Okay, so let's, let's see if I've done a good enough job for you. So this is my visual summary that I put together. And again, I can't sleep at night anyways, and I love this paper. Why not? Exactly. You're reading my mind. So this is my visual summary. Um, so I put this together last night um, after reading the paper. And what it, what it does is it says, a composite figure depicting a neuronal cell body in white with multiple dendritic arborizations and spines. And in B, a schematic of the methods used by Zhao et al. to introduce labeled glue A subunits in utero, panel A, and methods used to visualize the barrel cortex in B. Um, and then the typical two, Two photon micrograph is shown in C, which highlights the movement, uh, the different movement of surface AMPA receptor subunits like glue A1 to the shaft region on the left and stabilization at spines on the right. The lower panel shows the overall distribution of glue A1 subunits and spine size. So can you can you figure out based on this with a little bit of thought and um, thinking about how this might be put together, what they did in this experiment and what sort of results they might have gotten based on the title as well as what I've just given you. If you can, then that's like a, a perfect score. And you should be able to put together um, a lot of it. So what I did was I simply took one of the figures from their paper as is, and I took another one of these. I didn't put the citation down here at the bottom, which would have made it um, complete, complete. Um, but that, that would be it. That's all I'm expecting from you from that visual summary, okay? If you wanna draw your own figure, fine. If you just wanna use one or two figures from the paper itself, also fine. Um, I would include like a, a really brief summary at the bottom. So I also, because I had nothing better to do um, at two o'clock in the morning, started writing out my paper summary as well. I, I actually really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy writing your paper summary. I actually wrote more than one because there were like three papers that were really exciting in Nature Neuroscience yesterday. Um, so again, this, this part here takes no time to um, put up. And then the background and introduction, um, about 100 words. This is what I'm looking for. It's really just a background into why did they do this study? They actually put that in their own introduction. And I'll leave all of this up for you um, on the YouTube link uh, later on. But um, you know, we've already gone through this in our class. People want to be able to visualize AMPA receptor movement during LTP. This group has actually gone ahead and did that by stimulating the whiskers and then visualizing the barrel cortex. They're actually able to see AMPA receptor subunits moving into spines in real time and that they lasted there um, after the stimulation was over. Again, the material and some methods, um, I just uh, literally just wrote that based on what I was reading as I was going along. And I didn't uh, spend too much time actually doing much more than that. Yes. Yes, the, the most important one. So don't, don't worry, I, I put this here, um, sorry, software and statistical packages were used. I didn't really need that. I, I know some of you might be worried, what if it's too short, right? Um, like should I put in like extra filler? So I put in extra filler here, I didn't need to. You don't, you don't have to actually go through how the test was done. Like behavioral tests were um, performed using like a T maze or tests of anxiety involved like an elevated plus maze, whatever. You don't have to explain it. Yep. I didn't explain like how they created these constructs, nor did I explain like how they did the two photon microscopy. Yes, questions? Yes. Yeah. Yep, you can just put the citation on the bottom of the figure or sort of as a footnote, either one. Yep. 
Nope, you don't have to. The ones that are the most relevant for your paper at this time. Yep. Okay, um, so I'll leave all of that. The last thing I'll just talk to you about, your, your midterm, uh, 20 multiple choice quest questions, two to, two to three short answers. Um, you're going to actually, as part of your participation grade, um, this Thursday, you're all going to be assigned like one question. There will be about five or six. You'll all get one question assigned to you. Your um, student number, the last, uh, the first five digits will be given. You'll find your student number. You'll have a number beside it, and then you'll be able to pick out which question you're supposed to give like five or six sentences on. Is to get you thinking and getting you through your notes for the um, upcoming midterm. Um, and I want you to do that. You'll Just by doing that, you'll get like marks automatically um, as part of your participation. I'm not going to be evaluating your responses in any way. I just want to make sure that you're starting to study. Um, and then we'll talk about study material packages uh, on Thursday as well. Okay, so good luck on all of your midterms if you have any today. Tuesday.